Hi guys, welcome to part 10. I'm kind of clearing my mouth because I ate some Skittles, sorry. I was getting all intense about this book and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't stop now. We're getting to some juicy part, right? Okay. Chapter 41. We're on part 10 already. We're almost to the end. Look at my book. Look at how much we are already through. It's so good, I can't stop. What am I gonna do when I'm done? I'm gonna have to find another book to read. I'll have to find, mm, I'll talk about that later. Anyways, chapter 41, here we go. He found the shovel and the jars, he's going back. Zero's condition continued to improve. Stanley slowly peeled an onion. He liked eating them one layer at a time. The water hole was now almost as large as the holes he had dug back at Camp Green Lake. It contained almost two feet of murky water. Stanley had dug it all himself. Zero had offered to help, but Stanley thought it better for Zero to save his strength. It was a lot harder to dig in water than it was in a dry lake. Stanley was surprised that he himself hadn't gotten sick, either from the sploosh, the dirty water, or from living on onions. He used to get sick quite a lot back at home. Both boys were barefoot. They had washed their socks, they all, and all their clothes were very dirty, but their socks were definitely the worst. They didn't dip their socks into the hole, afraid to contaminate the water. Instead, they filled the jars and poured the water over the dirty socks. I didn't go to the homeless shelter very often, Cyril said. Just if the weather was really bad, I'd have to find someone to pretend to be my mom. If I had just gone by myself, they would have asked me a bunch of questions. If they found out I didn't have a mom, they would have me a they would they would have made me a ward of the state. What's a ward of the state? Zero smiled. I don't know, but I didn't like the sound of it. Stanley remembered Mr. Pandansky telling the warden that Zero was a ward of the state. He wondered if Zero knew he'd become one. I liked sleeping outside, said Zero. I used to pretend I was a Cub Scout. I always wanted to be a Cub Scout. I'd see them at the park in their blue uniforms. I was never a Cub Scout, said Stanley. I wasn't good at social stuff like that. Kids made fun of me because I was fat. I like the blue uniforms, said Zero. Maybe I wouldn't have, maybe I wouldn't have liked being a Cub Scout. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. My mother was once a Girl Scout, said Zero. I thought you said you didn't have a mother. Everybody has to have a mother, said Zero. Well, yeah, I know that. She said she once won a prize for selling the most Girl Scout cookies, said Zero. She was real proud of that. Stanley peeled off another layer of his onion. We always took what we needed, Zero said. When I was little, I didn't even know it was stealing. I don't remember when I found out, but we just took what we needed, never more. So when I saw the shoes on display in the shelter, I just reached in the glass case and took them. Clyde Livingston's shoes? Asked Stanley. I didn't know they were his. I just thought they were somebody's old shoes. It was better to take someone's old shoes, I thought, than steal a pair of new ones. I didn't know they were famous. There was a sign, but of course I couldn't read it. Then the next thing I know, everybody's making this big deal about the shoes and how they are missing. It's kind of funny in a way. The whole place is going crazy. There I was wearing the shoes and everyone's running around saying, what happened to the shoes? The shoes are gone. I just walked out the door. No one noticed me. When I got outside, I ran to the corner, immediately took off the shoes. I put them on top of a parked car. I remember they smelled really bad. Yeah, those were them, said Stanley. Did they fit you? Pretty much. Stanley remembered being surprised at Clyde Livingston's small shoe size. Stanley's shoes were bigger. Clyde Livingston had small, quick feet. Stanley's feet were big and slow. I should have just kept them. I'd already made it out of the shelter and everything. I ended up getting arrested the next day when I tried to walk out of a shoe store with a new pair of sneakers. If I had just kept those old, smelly sneakers, then neither of us would be here right now. Zero, chapter 42. Zero became strong enough to help dig the hole. When he finished, it was over six feet deep. He filled the bottom with rocks to help separate the water from the dirt. He was still the best hole digger around. That's the last hole I will ever dig, he declared, throwing down the shovel. Stanley smiled. 
He wished it were true, but he knew they would have no choice but to eventually return to Camp Green Lake. They couldn't live on onions forever. They had been completely around the big thumb. It was like a giant sundial. They followed the shade. They were able to see in all directions. There was no place to go. The mountain was surrounded by desert. Zero stared at Big Thumb. Must have a hole in it, he said. Filled with water, you think? Where else could the water be coming from, Zero asked. Water doesn't run uphill. Stanley bit into an onion. Didn't burn his eyes or nose. In fact, he no longer noticed a particularly strong taste. He remembered when he had first carried Zero up the hill, how the air had smelled bitter. It was the smell of thousands of onions growing and rotting and sprouting. Now he didn't smell a thing. How many onions do you think we've eaten? He asked. Zero shrugged, I don't even know how long we've been here. I'd say about a week and we probably each eat about 20 onions a day. So that's 280 onions, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I bet we really stink. Two nights later, Stanley lay awake, staring up at the star-filled sky. He was too happy to fall asleep. He knew he had no reason to be happy. He had heard or read somewhere that right before a person freezes to death, he suddenly feels nice and warm. He wondered if perhaps he was experiencing something like that. It occurred to him that he couldn't really remember the last time he felt happiness. It wasn't just being sent to Camp Green Lake that had made him his life miserable. Before that, he'd been unhappy at school, where he had no friends, and bullies like Derek Dunn, picked on him. No one liked him. And the truth was, he didn't especially like himself. <laughs> this wolf don't like this. It makes me heartbroken. He wondered if he was delirious. He looked over. He liked himself now. He wondered if he was delirious. He looked over at Zero sleeping near him. Zero's face was lit in the starlight. And there was a flower petal in front of his nose that moved back and forth as he breathed. It reminded Stanley of something out of cartoon, Zero breathed in and the pedal was drawn up, almost touching his nose. Zero breathed out and the pedal moved toward his chin. It stayed on Zero's face for an amazingly long time before it started fluttering, fluttering off to the side. Stanley considered placing it back on front of Zero's nose, but it wouldn't be the same. It seemed like Zero had lived at Camp Green Lake forever, but as Stanley thought about it now, he realized that Zero must have gotten there no more than a month or two before him. Zero was actually arrested a day later, but Stanley's trial kept getting delayed because of baseball. He remembered that Zero had said a few days before if Zero had just kept those shoes, then neither of them would be here right now. As Stanley stared at the glittering sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car. He was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him on the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck, struck him. Now he thought again. It was more than a coincidence. It had to be destiny. Maybe they wouldn't have to return to Camp Green Lake, he thought. Maybe they could make it past the camp, then follow the dirt road back to civilization. They could fill the sack with onions and three jars with water. And he had his canteen as well. They could refill their jars in the canteen camp, maybe sneak into the kitchen and get some food. He doubted any counselors were still on guard. Everyone had to think they were dead, buzzard food. It would mean living the rest of his life as a fugitive. The police would always be after him. At least he could call his parents and tell them he was still alive. But he couldn't go visit them in case the police were watching in the apartment. Although, if everyone thought he was dead, they wouldn't bother to watch the apartment. He would have to somehow get a new identity. Now I'm really thinking crazy, he thought. I won't. He wondered if a crazy person wonders if he's crazy. What do you guys think? Does a crazy person wonder if they're crazy? Who knows? But even as he thought this, an even crazier idea popped into his head. He knew it was too crazy to even consider. Still, he was going to be a fugitive for the rest of his life. It would help to have some money, perhaps a treasure chest full of money. You're crazy, he told himself. Besides, just because he found a lipstick container with KB on it, that doesn't mean there was treasure buried there. It's crazy. Part of his crazy feelings of happiness, or maybe it was destiny. He reached over and shook Zero's arm. Hey, Zero. Huh? Zero, wake up. What? What is it? Zero raised his hand. You want to dig one more hole? Stanley asked him. Chapter 43. 
You weren't always homeless, Ciro said. I remember a yellow room. How old were you when you, Stanley, started to ask, but couldn't find the right words, moved out? I don't know. I must have been real little because I don't remember it too much. I don't remember moving out. I remember standing in a crib with my mother saying to me, she held my wrists and made my hands clap together. She used to sing that song to me, that one you sang. It was different, though. Zero spoke slowly as if searching his brain for memories and clues. And then later, I know we lived on the street, but I don't know why we left the house. I'm pretty sure it was a house and not an apartment. I know my room was yellow. <clears throat> it was late afternoon. They were resting in the sh shadow of the thumb. They had spent the morning picking onions and putting them in the sack. It didn't take long, but long enough so that they had to wait another day before heading down the mountain. They wanted to leave at the first hint of daylight so they'd have plenty of time to make it to Camp Green Lake before dark. Stanley wanted to be sure he could find the right hole. Then they would hide by it until everyone went to sleep. They would dig for as long as it seemed safe and not a second longer. And then, treasure or no treasure, they'd head up the dirt road. If it was absolutely safe, they'd try to steal some food and water from the camp kitchen. I'm good at sneaking in and out of places, Cyril had said. Remember, Stanley warned, the door to the rec room squeaks. Now he lay on his back trying to save his strength for the long days ahead. He wondered what happened to Zero's parents, but he didn't ask. Zero didn't like answering questions. It was better to just let him talk when he felt like it. Stanley thought about his own parents in, in her letter. In her last letter, his mom was worried that they might be evicted from their apartment because of the smell of burning sneakers. They could easily become homeless as well. Again, he wondered if they'd been told that he ran away from camp. Were they told that he was dead? An image appeared in his head of his parents hugging each other and crying. He tried not to think about it. Instead, he tried to recapture the feelings he'd had the night before, the inexplicable feeling of happiness, the sense of destiny. But those feelings didn't return. He just felt scared. Next morning, they headed down the mountain. They dumped their caps in the water hole before putting them on their heads. Zero held the shovel and Stanley carried the sack, which was crammed with onions and three jars of water. They left the pieces of the broken jar on the mountain. This is where I found the shovel, Stanley said, pointing at the patch of weeds. Zero turned and looked up toward the mountain. That's a long way. You were light, said Stanley. You'd already thrown up everything that was inside your stomach. He shifted the sack from one shoulder to the other. It was heavy. He stepped on a loose rock, slipped and fell hard. The next thing he knew, he was sliding down the steep side of the mountain. He dropped the sack. The onions spilled all around him. He slid into a patch of weeds and grabbed onto a thorny vine. The vine ripped out of the earth but slowed him enough. He was able to stop himself. Are you all right? Zero asked from above. Stanley groaned. Oh, yeah, he said. He was all right. He was worried more about the jars of water. Cyril climbed down after him, retrieving the sack along the way. Stanley pulled some thorns out of his pant legs. The jars hadn't broken. The onions had protected them, like styrofoam packing material. Glad you didn't do that when you were carrying me, said Zero. They lost about a third of the onions, but recovered as many as, of them as they continued down the mountain. When they reached the bottom, the sun was just rising above the lake. They walked directly toward it. Soon they stood at the edge of the cliff, looking down on the dry lake bed. Stanley wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the remains of Mary Lou off in the distance. You thirsty? No, said Zero. How about you? No, Stanley lied. He didn't want to be the first one to take a drink. Although they didn't mention it, it had become a kind of challenge between him and Zero. They climbed down into the frying pan. It was a different spot from where they had climbed up. They eased themselves down from the edge or from the ledge to another, and then themselves slide in the other places, being especially careful of, with the sack. Stanley could no longer see the Mary Lou, but headed in what he thought was the right direction. As the sun rose, so did the familiar haze of the heat and dirt. You thirsty? Zero asked. No. Because you have three full jars of water, said Zero. I thought maybe it was getting too heavy for you. If you drink some, it will lighten your load. I'm not thirsty, said Stanley, but if you want to drink, I'll give you some. I'm not thirsty, said Zero. I was just worried about you. Stanley smiled. I'm a camel, he said. <laughs> they walked for what seemed like a very long time and still never came across the Mary Lou. 
Stanley was pretty sure they were heading in the right direction. He remembered that when they left the boat, they were headed toward the setting sun. Now they were headed toward the rising sun. He knew the sun didn't rise and set exactly in the east and west, more southeast and southwest, but he wasn't sure how that made a difference. His throat felt as if it were coated in sandpaper. You sure you're not thirsty? He asked. Not me, said Zero. His voice was dry and raspy. When they did finally take a drink, they agreed to do it at the same time. Zero, who was now carrying the sack, set it down and took out two jars, giving one to Stanley. They decided to save the canteen for last, since it couldn't accidentally break. You know I'm not thirsty, Stanley said as he unscrewed the lid. I'm just drinking so you will. I'm just drinking so you will, said Zero. They clinked the jars together and each watching the other poured the water into the stubborn mouths. Zero was the first to spot Mary Lou, maybe a quarter mile away and just a little off to the right. They headed for it. It wasn't even noon when they reached the boat. They set against the shady side and rested. I don't know what happened to my mother, Zero said. She left and never came back. Stanley peeled an onion. She couldn't always take me with her, Zero said. Sometimes she had to do things by herself. Stanley had the feeling that Zero was explaining things to himself. She told me to wait in a certain place for her. When I was real little, I had to wait in small areas, like on a porch step or a doorway. Now, don't leave here until I get back, she'd say. I never liked it when she left. I had a stuffed animal, a little giraffe, and I'd hug it the whole time she was gone. When I got bigger, I was allowed to stay in bigger areas, like stay on this block or don't leave the park. But even then, I still held Jaffe. Stanley guessed that Jaffe was the name of Zero's giraffe. And then one day, she didn't come back, Zero said. His voice out sounded hollow, suddenly. I waited for her at Laney Park. Laney Park, said Stanley. I've been there. You know the playscape, asked Zero. Yeah, I've played on it. I waited there for more than a month, said Zero. You know that tunnel that you crawl through between the slide and the swinging bridge? That's where I slept. They ate four onions apiece and drank about a half a jar of water. Stanley stood up and looked around. Everything looked the same in all directions. When I was when I left camp, I was heading straight toward the Big Thumb, he said. I saw the boat off to the right. So that means we have to turn a little to the left. <clears throat> Zero was lost in What? Okay, he said. They headed out. It was Stanley's turn to carry the sack. Some kids had a birthday party, Zero said. I guess it was about two weeks after my mom left. It was a picnic table to the playscape and balloons were tied to it. The kids looked to be the same age as me. One girl said hi to me and asked me if I wanted to play. I wanted to, but I didn't. I knew I didn't belong at the party, even though it wasn't their playscape. There was this one mother who kept staring at me like I was some kind of monster. And later a boy asked me if I wanted a piece of cake, but then the same mother told me, go away. And she told all the kids to stay away from me, so I never got a piece of cake. I ran away so fast, I forgot Jaffe. Oh my gosh, that's so heartbreaking. Did you find him? Did you find it? For a moment, Zero didn't answer, then he said, he wasn't real. Stanley thought again about his own parents, how awful it would be for them. to never know if he was dead or alive. He realized it was how Zero must have felt not knowing whatever happened to his own mother. He wondered why Zero never mentioned his father. Hold on, we're going the wrong way. No, this is right. You were heading toward the Big Thumb when you saw the boat off to your right. That means we should have turned right when we left the boat. You sure? Zero drew a diagram in the dirt. And here's his diagram. Stanley still wasn't sure. We need to go this way, Zero said, drawing a line on the map, and then heading that way himself. Stanley followed it and feel right to him, but Zero seemed sure. Sometime in the middle of the afternoon, a cloud drifted across the sky and blocked out the sun. It was a welcome relief. Once again, Stanley felt the destiny was on his side. Zero stopped and held out his arm to stop Stanley too. Listen, 
she whispered. Stanley didn't hear anything. They continued walking very quietly and soon began to make out the faint sounds of candle relight. They were still too far away to see the camp, but they could hear a blend of indistinct voices. As they got closer, he occasionally could hear Mr. Sir's distinctive bark. They walked slowly and quietly, aware that sound travels in both directions. They approached a cluster of holes. Let's wait here until they go in, said Zero. Stanley nodded. He checked to make sure there was nothing living in it. Then he climbed down into a hole. Zero climbed into next to him. Despite having gone the wrong way for a while, it hadn't taken them nearly as long as Stanley had expected. Now they just had to wait. The sun cut through the cloud, and Stanley felt its rays beating down on him. But soon more clouds filled the sky, shading Stanley in his hole. He waited until he was certain the last campers had finished for the day. Then he waited a little longer. As quietly as possible, he and Zero climbed up out of their holes and crept toward camp. Stanley held the sack in front of him, cradled in his arms, instead of over his shoulder, to keep the jars from clanking against each other. A wave of terror rushed over him when he saw the compound. The tents, the rec room, the warm's cabin under the two oak trees, the fear made him dizzy. He took a breath, summoned his courage, and continued. That's the one, he whispered, pointing out the hole where he found the cold tube. It was still about 50 yards away, but Stanley was pretty sure it was the right hole. There was no need to risk going any closer. They climbed down into adjacent holes and waited for the camp to fall asleep. 44. Stanley tried to sleep, but not knowing when he'd get the chance again. He heard the showers and later the sound of dinner. He heard the creaking of the rec room door. His fingers drummed against the side of the hole. He heard his own heartbeat. He took a drink from the canteen. He had given Zero the water jars. They each had a good supply of onions. He wasn't sure how long he had remained in the hole, maybe five hours. He was surprised when he heard Zero whispering for him to wake up. He didn't think he'd fallen asleep. If he had, he thought he must have been for at least five minutes. Although when he opened his eyes, he was surprised how dark it was. There was only one light on that camp, in the office. The sky was cloudy, so there was very little starlight. Stanley could see a silver sliver of a moon which appeared and disappeared among the clouds. He carefully led Zero to the hole, which was hard to find in the darkness. He stumbled over a small pile of dirt. I think this is it. You think? Zero asked. It's it, said Stanley, sounding more certain than he really was. He climbed down, Zero handed him the shovel. Stanley stuck the shovel into the dirt at the bottom of the hole and stepped into the back of the blade. He felt it sink beneath its weight. He scooped out some dirt and tossed it off the side. Then he brought the shovel back down. Zero watched for a while. I'm going to try to refill our water jars, he said. Stanley took a deep breath and exhaled. Be careful, he said, then continued digging. It was so dark, he couldn't even see the end of his show. For all he knew, he could be digging up gold and diamonds instead of dirt. He thought each shovel close to his face. He brought each shovel full close to his face to try to see if anything was there before dumping it out in the hole. As he made the hole deeper, it became harder to lift the dirt up out and out. It was five feet deep before it, he even started. He decided to use his efforts to make it wider instead. This made more sense, he told himself. If Kate Barlow had buried a treasure chest, she probably would have been it she probably would have been able to dig much deeper, so why should he? Of course Kate Barlow probably had a whole gang of thieves helping her. You want some breakfast? Stanley jumped out at the sound of Zero Voice. He hadn't heard him approach. Zero handed him down a box of cereal. Stanley carefully poured some cereal into his mouth. He didn't want to put his dirty hands inside the box. He nearly gagged on the ultra sweet taste. They were sugar frosted flakes. And after eat eating nothing but onions for more than a week, he had trouble adjusting to the flavor. He washed them down with a swig of water. Zero took over the digging. Stanley sifted his fingers through the fresh piles of dirt in case he missed any anything. He wished he had a flashlight. A diamond no bigger than a pebble would be worth thousands of dollars. Yet there was no way to see it. They finished the water that Zero had gotten from the spigot. Stanley said he'd go fill the jars again, but Zero insisted that he'd do it instead. No offense, but you take too much you make too much noise when you walk. You're too big. Stanley returned to the hole as the whole wider parts of the surface kept caving in. They were running out of room to make it much wider. 
<clears throat> they would first have to move some of the surrounding dirt piles out of the way. He wondered how much time it would before the camp woke up. How's it going, Zero said. Returned with the water. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. He brought the shovel down inside a hole, shaving off a slice of dirt wall. As he did so, he felt the shovel bounce off something hard. What was that? Zero asked. Stanley didn't know. He moved the shovel up and down the side of the hole. As the dirt chipped and flaked away, the hard object became more pronounced. It was sticking out of the side of the hole, about a foot and a half from the bottom. He felt it with his hands. What is it? Zero asked. He could just feel the corner of it. Most of it was still buried. It had the cool, smooth texture of metal. I think I might have found the treasure chest, he said. His voice was filled more with astonishment with excitement. Really? said Zero. I think so, Stanley said. The hole was wide enough for him to hold the shovel lengthwise and dig sideways into the wall. He knew he had to dig very carefully. He didn't want the side of the hole to collapse, along with the huge pile of dirt directly above him. He scraped at the dirt wall until he exposed one entire side of the box-like object. He ran his fingers over it. It felt to be about eight inches tall and almost about two feet wide. He had no way of knowing how far into the earth it extended. He tried pulling it out, but it wouldn't budge. He was afraid that the only way to get it was to first start was to start back up at the surface and dig down. They didn't have time for that. I'm going to try to dig a hole underneath it, he said. Then maybe I can pull it out and slip it out. Go for it, said Zero. Stanley jammed the shovel in the bottom edge of his soul. Carefully began to dig the tunnel underneath the metal object. He hoped it didn't cave in. Occasionally, he'd stop, stoop down, and try to feel the far end of the box. But when the tunnel was long as his arm, he still couldn't feel the other side. Once again, he tried pulling it out, but it was firmly in the ground. He pulled too hard, he feared. He'd cause a cave-in. He knew that when he was ready to pull it out, he would have to do it quickly before the ground above it collapsed. As the tunnel grew deeper and wider and more precarious, Stanley was able to feel latches on the end of the box and then a leather handle. It wasn't really a box. I think it might be some kind of metal suitcase, he told Zero. Can you pry it loose with the shovel, Zero suggested. I'm afraid the side of the hole will collapse. Might as well give it a try, said Zero. Stanley took a sip of water. Might as well, he said. He forced the tip of the shovel between the dirt top of the metal case and tried to wedge it free. He wished he could see what he was doing. He worked the end of the shovel back and forth, up and down until he felt the suitcase fall free. Then he felt the dirt come piling down on top of it. But it wasn't a huge cave-in. As he knelt down the hole, he could tell that only a small portion of the earth had collapsed. He dug with his hands until he found the leather handle and then pulled the suitcase up and out of the dirt. I got it! He exclaimed. It was heavy. He handed it to Zero. You did it, Zero said, taking from him. We did it. He gathered up the remaining strength and tried to pull it up himself out of the hole. Suddenly, a bright light was shining on his face. Thank you, said the warden. You boys have been a big help. Oh my gosh, how did the warden see them doing it? That is the end of part 10. You guys, we are nearing towards the end. And how did the warden see? Oh my gosh, they were being so quiet. Son of a gun. This is freaky. How did the warden? Oh no, 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 no. All their hard work. We have to keep going to see what happens, you guys. All right, I'll see you for part Oh my gosh, 11, and we're nearing the end now. We are at the end. We don't have many pages left. Peace, I'll see you soon.